I apologize. This is, uh, <coughs> see. So, I mean, I, I don't know how much of your computer systems or computer architecture you remember here. Um, um, so, pretty much similar to what a computer system does here, the data mining process involves um, processing of input data, right? So, one of the key ingredients is always data, right? Uh, and in fact, most people have, that have conducted studies in, uh, superficial studies in data mining, uh, make mention of the fact that one of the most challenging things when it comes to data mining is a process called data preparation and uh, the data processing. These are the stages or phases that we're going to discuss are uh, trivial to a certain extent. All you have to do is understand the different algorithms that exist out there um, and be in a position to identify the appropriate, appropriate one or ones to apply to whatever project you're working towards. Right. Um, so similar to how a computer works, obviously, uh, data mining involves uh, getting input for input data, doing some sort of processing, and then what you get back is information, right? Output data, something that makes sense. Um, um, and of course, this has become important because of the increasing amount of informational data that we're generating. Right? Key thing here that we've probably, in case we've forgotten here, uh, usually when you're working with uh, data or raw facts, there's, there's little you can do to make sense out of that information. You need to process it and get back information. Right? <clears throat> so you input raw facts or data and then get back information. Um, and, and really, if you look at studies, like I said, that have been done, you realize that people have highlighted uh, the different key parts associated with the data mining process, irrespective of the, the approach that you've, you might decide to take or which model you might want to use to undertake your, your, your data mining project. It turns out that the, these uh, key phases that are involved, right? So at some stage, you'd need to make sense of the domain you're working in, uh, understand the input data that you're going to use, um, you'd have to prepare uh, or pre-process the information, right? Um, and then you come up with some sort of models or data models that you use to make sense of the data that you've prepared. Key thing, you need to evaluate whatever it is you've implemented. And then finally, you deploy the results, right? And deploying the results takes so many different shapes and forms, right? APIs, full-fledged applications, right? Um, but you notice here that uh, in terms of the relative effort, you notice that um, all these different papers here seem to cite the fact that data preparation and data understanding um, are the things where you'd spend the vast majority of your time. And in fact, I encourage you to ask, ask the people that are going to come to give these talks about where or which parts were, were more challenging. They'll tell you it's these, right? At some stage, you have to label the data, for instance. It's not easy, right? Uh, once you label that training, your machine learning model is trivial. Evaluating it is as easy as just identifying, oh, I will evaluate uh, support vector machines against, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, decision trees, for instance, or random forests. And then depending on what the results uh, I, I get, which one is more superior is the one that I'll pick, and then I deploy my model. That's it, right? Um, but this is where again, you end up spending the vast majority of your time. So, yeah. What's that deal? Uh, data modeling, so it's like modeling. Yeah. The actual implementation, actually, you could view this as implementation. Um, <clears throat> and, and it turns out that there are a number of uh, data mining models, and we are, we are confused, we are interchanging our definition of the mode, right? When, um, when we are, once we start our discussion of implementation, we'll be referring to the models to be the, 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 the things that we implement, right? The, the things that we would have to, to do the processing. Um, but in this case, we're referring to the frameworks or the guiding principles that you'd use for this particular slide, right? So it turns out that there are a number of approaches that you can take for you to undertake a data mining project, right? Um, and really, if you read up on this paper, you realize that most of these different models that have been proposed stem from work that was done by FIAD et al., right? Um, this was the beginning, right? You notice you can literally trace the history of the different models that are out there. Um, for the vast majority of people that have bothered to, to, um, to explicitly state which approach they took, you almost always have the CRISP-DM model. To a certain extent, maybe same, right? There's a graph which shows you the popularity of the different models I'll show you just now. But the bottom line is that there are so many of them. 
um, depending on what sort of problem you might be working towards, perhaps it might be important for you to justify why you would set off a crisp DM as opposed to SEMA. Right? Even if it means you just find by pointing potential readers to existing literature to say, I did this because these people claim A, B, C, D. Right? But you always want to justify anyway. Um, and really, if you're curious to look at uh, how some of these uh, um, approaches, you know, what sort of things uh, they take into account, this is, uh, uh, this is the knowledge discovery and data process proposed by FIAT, right? You notice that uh, key phases here is uh, the data. Um, from the data, you sieve out what you want to use because it's not always the case that when you identify a data source or data that you're going to incorporate into your model that you end up using all the data, right? You'd have to select what you want to use, pick out the important things. <coughs> um, then uh, from the target data, you derive the process data, and then you need to transform this, right? Um, you realize that uh, for most of these estimators or linear algorithms that you work with, they expect the input format to be in a certain way. Uh, so assuming you're working with user grades, for instance, you'd have to transform those user grades into a form that the estimators will be able to accept. Okay? Uh, so data transformation, and then you derive patterns, and then from the patterns you get knowledge. Right? Apparently there's a difference between data, information, and knowledge, right? So I guess the patterns would be your information, and then you combine the different patterns, you derive knowledge. Um, I don't know why I included uh, this work by, this should be, which one is this? I think it should be by Kaben at Al. But I just randomly put some of these things there just to showcase the fact that there are a number of different approaches out there. Right? And, and you notice here that uh, if you were to compare this initial model proposed by Fayad et al. Um, and this one, you notice that even though the ways that are being used are somewhat different here, but there are certain similarities here, right? Um, right? But there you go. Um, and then there are people that have gone a step further uh, to try and compare the different approaches. Uh, in case people are interested, uh, you can clearly see that the different methodologies that exist in literature, people have gone a step further to look at the different methodologies and identify the key phases associated with those methodologies. More importantly, compare them with other existing methodologies, right? Um, I guess the interesting thing for me here, especially if we make reference to the CRISP DM here, is that you can literally fit in the different phases associated with these other methodologies into the CRISP DM model itself. Um, uh, this is, I guess, a more detailed variation of this. Uh, so if you're interested, I do encourage you to read, and it turns out this is the same paper, by the way. I would encourage you to, to read up on, on this. It's, it's uh, interesting, but pretty odd. I think it was done almost a decade ago, 2010, but uh, if not 2006, but still quite useful. Especially if uh, there are always uh, strange people that would be in a VV. Should attend some of these oral exams, right? You, you make the mistake of saying, I use the CRISP DM model. Um, if, if someone is in the room and they don't understand the technical details of what you did and they want to ask something, people always want to ask something, why did you use the CRISP DM model, right? You want to be able to justify, <laughs> right? And the nice way of justifying is just putting in maybe a section in your dissertation in the related work chapter to say we looked at uh, uh, the KDD process by Fayad et al. We also looked at the CRISP DM. We looked at SEMA, uh, and then we also looked at uh, maybe the KDD roadmap, and then we combined the two, and we realized that oh, for us this was the most appropriate because of ABCD, right? I don't know. Um, anyway, in trying to justify why we, uh, in this course, we're using crisp DM. One of the things is, it's been tried and tested. A number of polls have been done. Lo and behold, if you go here, uh, KD Nuggets, you'll find polls that uh, were done from 2004. I think the most earliest one was 2014 or something. You notice that uh, it turns out that the crisp DM is the most popular. Is, by the way, these are practitioners, that are mining practitioners, uh, but still. Um, it gives you a sneak preview of what you should gravitate towards, right? at least in so far as industry is concerned. What you will notice as you are going through this is a nice write-up on this particular website, K, 
KD nuggets about how they conduct this poll. And when you read this paper, what you realize is that one of the things that all these different models have in common is the fact that those two phases are the ones that are time consuming. Data preparation and is it data, I don't know if it was that understanding that I, these two parts. Right. So irrespective of which model you look at, it's almost always the case that they'll bring out the fact, or highlight the fact that these are the most involving parts. Uh, anyway. Yeah. Yes. Is there a uh, By the way, I was uh, I, I was reading up on an interesting uh, write-up. Right, this person was asking. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I'm veering off here. I hope you won't forget the question. Was asking in graduate sh school should we put our, should we raise up our hands or something? I I, I just thought about it when you. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, is there a good reason why? Uh, the first DA uh, model is widely used. Is it because, is there a good reason why? Is it because it's easy? No, I, I wouldn't really say uh, easy per se. I would say, um, I guess, popularity, and then it's also been revised a couple of times as well. So people are continuously making changes. And and I guess the, the, these other models are more or less like. Uh, Methodologies that we arrived at as part of like research projects, right? So the reason it's popular is because um, I guess it's one that is mostly used in industry. You could say that so it's just popularity. Um, I don't think there's a there's a. I mean, so if you interesting thing here is if you that's an interesting question, though. If you look at <coughs> Yeah, I don't know if there's another good reason aside from the fact that it's the most widely used, right? It's it's like uh, us asking why relational database management systems are used more as opposed to, you know, something similar to that, I guess. But we can look it up, and I, I don't know, maybe in this uh, in this paper there could be a valid reason as to why. Uh, but when when it comes to justifying. What you could do is it takes into account all the key phases associated with the data mining project. That's not to say that these others don't, they do as well, right? There's homework, we could try and see if there's a, there are other reasons. I suppose that would be nice. <coughs> I wonder if Robert has a, a reason as to why he's using the CRISP DM, because I think he went through a process in his, as part of his literature review, he he uh, studied you know these different methodologies and the decided to use the crisp DM, I don't know why. Um, and this is a bad poll, right? It's just 200 votes, by the way. So, but still, it's represented enough. So, so the thing, they're calling the crisp DM, cross industry standard process for data mining, right? DM data mining. Um, ideally, what it does is it breaks down the, um, the phases, you know, it associates the phases um, in line with the key things that you end up doing as you're undertaking, undertaking this data mining project. Um, and six of them really, you start off by trying to and we explain all these different things in phases. You want to be able to understand the domain you're working in, right? So uh, if you're trying to solve a problem for PACRA or if it's predicting student scores, for instance, you want to understand uh, how students are assessed, for instance, right? If you're not an expert. Uh, but if you've been teaching for a long time, you probably already uh, have knowledge of the domain you're working in. Um, and then you go through a process of trying to understand the data that you, you would be working with, right? So data understanding. Um, you notice that this in part involves identifying the different data sources that you would use to implement your model. You prepare the data that you've identified, right? So, Data understanding, data collection, uh, identification of sources, and then once you pull that information, you need to prepare it. Um, and we have a dedicated lecture session where we look at pre-processing and transformation of data. And then after you do that, you implement your model. Implementing uh, the model is as easy as just uh, identifying all the potential estimators or learning algorithms that you can use, and then empirically test them or design experiments to ascertain which one is the best. 
and the metrics that you look at, accuracy for instance, precision, recall, right, all those fancy things. Um, so after you implement your model, yes, you need to evaluate it, which is what I was talking about here. Uh, while the evaluation can take uh, different forms, the different aspects that you can take into account, accuracy, when it comes, accuracy is almost always on the list. To what extent is this thing able to tell you to say this person has cancer? Does it have 90% accuracy? Is it 80% accuracy? Some other evaluation criteria that you can incorporate into this is, is this model useful, right? Uh, so all those different aspects, whenever you're throwing in ways like useful, uh, accurate, effective, you need to provide corresponding metrics that you're going to use to measure those different aspects. Uh, and we'll discuss all these different things, and as we are reading, you realize that uh, there's nothing complex here. Right? Finally, once you implement, you test your model to evaluate it, you deploy it so that people start using it, because that is the end goal, right? You're trying to solve a problem. How you solve it is you propose a solution. Once you come up with a solution, you deploy it. It could be a form of a web application, mobile application, an API perhaps, right? Um, right, so some of the things that you end up doing so far as business understanding is concerned here is, uh, this is a time when you identify the general objectives. The, thing, the problem you're trying to solve obviously has associated objectives. And the specific objectives, right? So you essentially just break up that general objective. Um, situation analysis to understand the problem space you're working, uh, you're working in. By the way, when it comes to the general and specific objectives, this would be mapped onto these things they call the, oh, you come up with your objectives when you're writing up your manuscript if you work on a data mining type project, right? <clears throat> so you, you come up with the general objective and the specific objective and the research question. So if you're interested in mapping up this data mining project to the uh, research project that you'd be uh, doing next year. Right? Yeah. Um, and then you, you just come up with broad goals of this data mining uh, process that you're going to go through. P people always make a mistake of, uh, I wonder if I can cite examples here. Just, it can be tempting to just dive in and start solving a problem, right? <laughs> Without actually explicitly figuring out what it is you're doing, right? Just, just because, I mean, I, it, it works in certain instances, I suppose. Eventually, you're bound to maybe come up with interesting things if you take that approach. But it's always advisable to understand the problem space first. Come up with the objectives. Why are you doing this? And then you plan your project, right? The usual, uh, uh, I guess, planning process that we go through here, scheduling and uh, risk management, all those things. Um, right, so when, obviously, when coming up with these general objectives, again, um, what you'd be doing is trying to collect the requirements that you need, right? Because it turns out that when somebody comes comes to you and says, uh, I have this problem, or I, we are entomologists and the problem we have is we have to maybe every month, I don't know, maybe every week, we have to go to the traps and manually co collect those uh, insects. They explain to you that is a problem. But before you can implement your solution, you need to collect different requirements that are associated to whatever solution you want to derive or come up with, right? Um, identify the factors that might potentially influence the outcome of the project, right? Uh, are there going to be challenges with data collection? If you read up on, on Francis' dissertation, you notice that one of the limitations of his study, he highlights the fact that uh, he had a limited data set, right? Uh, because they had to, to go and get images of these insects in the traps and whatnot, right? And so as they work around, apparently that was funny, he went, they went online and started searching for 4 MUM, right? An uh, issue came up. So they downloaded some of the images from um, from um, um, from the internet, and then they he also used uh, some fancy machine learning technique where uh, the data augmentation, where you you have one image of an insect, but then you transform it in different ways so that the orientation changes, it pixelates and whatnot, right? So these are things though that you you'd have to think about early on in the process. Right? Um, 
And then some of the things that you hope to get from this phase, obviously, is uh, the, the key objectives associated with the problem you're working on, right? Uh, background information or the problem area or problem space. Um, what you're going to use as a metric to signal the fact that you have been successful. So you go through all these six processes, right? Six phases, and you deploy the solution. How do we know you've been, you've done the right thing, right? You need to come up beforehand. You need to agree. If you're doing this for somebody else, you agree with the stakeholders to say this is what we're going to use to measure the relative success of the project. Um, <clears throat> right. And then when it comes to the situation analysis, obviously, I mean, um, you, you're just trying to figure out or identify the resources um, available, uh, the project, uh, the complete list of requirements associated with the project. Uh, I mean, if it's something that involves money, maybe do a cost-benefit analysis to see if it's actually worth doing, right? Uh, a key thing that came up with Francis, right? So a solution, and I like using Francis because it's something I've read recently. So I asked a question for him. So in this trap, right, the solution is simple. You have a trap, right? They collect insects, and then within this trap, um, I mean, simple things like they're using the Internet of Things here. There's, um, there's a device that syncs with the cloud, right? And so the way a solution works is these images, as they are captured, as the insects are captured, you get snapshots of the images, you send the payload of these images to the cloud, and then the model is, deploy is deployed on the cloud. It classifies this as being a 4 mm or not. And I, I asked him, I said, but how viable is this? How much data would you need for you to do this, right? Because you remember you're sending images, right? How many images are you sending? How often are you sending these images, right? Um, you know, so anyway, Francis, if this was being done in a real world setting, Francis would have had to do a cost-benefit analysis together with the entomologist, right? And I suggested to him, I asked him a rhetorical question, is it not possible to, because when you implement this model, you don't necessarily have to, it's not like it's online. There are certain models that have to constantly be fed data, right? So you're refreshing it constantly. But for certain models, you come up with a model, you implement it, that's it. It will never change, right? Because you don't expect it to change. I don't know if I'm making sense here, right? If the model doesn't change, why not put it here in the trap? It, it, you can save, you can save this. When, once you train a model, you can save it. When you save it, put it here. Instead of saying every time you're sending an image and then this classifies, the, there's an, it classifies the, the, the images, whether it's 4 mm or not, maybe it also tells you, it gives you a metric to what extent it thinks this is a 4 mm, and then it sends back a JSON response to say 4 mm with 90% uh, precision or something. Put it here, right? So that you cut down on the amount of money on debt or something, I don't know. But um, so these are things to think about, right? Cost benefit analysis. Um, uh, and then broad goals of the data mining project. Um, I wonder what I was trying to say is describe outputs that enable achievement. Oh, oh so the actual output that are coming in, uh, coming out from the model, right? Uh, you want to be able to describe them to your, uh, to the stakeholders, the owners of the project or something. Um, so the actual criteria um, that's going to signal whether uh, an outcome is successful or not in technical terms. These are the actual metrics I was talking about. Precision is this amount. The recall is this amount. The accuracy is this amount, right? The F score is this score, right? Uh, I mean, so the people you are implementing this model for would not be interested in, in, in these more technical details, but you still need them, right? Um, sometimes you might have to come up with a subjective criteria. Um, maybe once you implement your model, you still need a human being to come through and be part of the evaluation process and tell you to say, yes, we think this is what it actually is. Um, I have friends that uh, work on natural language generation type problems where the evaluation almost always involves a human being. So imagine a situation where, like you're generating content automatically, right? A machine generates content. You, you can't use these other metrics I was talking about to say the accuracy is 90%. You'd need a human being to say, read this passage, tell us, 
does this thing make sense? To what extent does it make sense? Uh, and in fact, for subjective criteria, as you notice as we are reading through the, the, the different uh, uh, existing literature, that um, what you do actually is you, for things that are subjective, you have people provide uh, relative judgments, a number of people. Typically, it's like three people, five people, an odd number, right? Um, and then you say, oh, because two of them say this, then the answer is true. You know, uh, there are funny metrics you can use as well to, to try and measure the relative closeness of the judgments that people uh, provide to you. Sometimes it could be yes, no, sometimes it could be only like it, like scale. To what extent do you think this passage is accurate? Is an accurate representation of this topic area? On a scale of one to five, oh, it's a five, oh, it's a three, it's a two, right? Subjective um, judgments. <coughs> Uh, I mean, the project planning is the usual things we are familiar with, <coughs> right? Uh, uh, just planning risk, uh, risk management, um, identify the different stages, and then you, uh, I, I guess you come up with, I don't know if we did this when we did software engineering, the, uh, the network diagrams, right, where you calculate the, uh, the duration and whatnot, this is what we're talking about here. And then, um, then comes the uh, data understanding part, right? Where what you're interested in are uh, four broad uh, things here. You identify where the data is going to come from. I mentioned earlier on that one of the key ingredients for a data mining project is the data, right? Because ultimately what you're trying to do is you're trying to, to mine for interesting patterns from the information. You have to have from the data, you have to have the data before you start that process, right? But before you get the data, sometimes the data might not be re readily available. You must identify where you're going to get the data from. Is it CSO? Is it uh, past reports that have been, uh, like if, about oh 20? Is it student scores, for instance? <laughs> a, a person I used to sit opposite with in grad school, he worked on a data mining project where he was trying to, to he came up with a prediction model for a rural area in Kenya. It's an interesting study. Uh, we did it as a reading last year. Um, you might want to read that if we want to discuss this. But um, he went crazy with that, right? He was looking at uh, how far a student stayed from, from school, how long they had to travel there. Um, crazy things like uh, the perceived competence of the teachers. So he went out there and get, dished out a questionnaire to the teachers in that location. How competent do you think you are? Of course, I mean, you don't ask a question directly because if you ask me, are you competent, right? And I, mean, I won't say no, right? But, but, uh, <laughs> but anyway, different things. In fact, he got too excited at some stage, he even incorporated religion, right? Because it turns out it's a predominantly Muslim area. Um, uh, one of his supervisors was not very happy with that. But his argument was that uh, because of uh, Friday afternoon prayers, maybe that would compromise things and whatnot. But, but anyway, what I'm trying to point at is the, is the fact that uh, data sources, you'd have to sit there. Sometimes you might not be able to identify the data sources yourself, and so you need to identify domain experts. You sit down with them, you ask them how they do things so that you understand where you can get the information from. You might not be a teacher and you're solving a problem in education. How do you find out? Same thing, I guess. You go there, you talk to them, questionnaires, you observe them perhaps to try and understand how they work, right? Um, but the, the, the other interesting thing about identification of data sources is there's no such thing as, oh, I have enough, enough data, now I can stop. You can, you can collect as much information as you want. It turns out that you eventually you'd have to go through a, a process called uh, Feature selection, right? What you'd be doing once you identify your data sources and you collect that is a feature extraction process, but you go through a feature selection process where you identify empirically the most important features. Not everything could be important, right? but you go through a feature selection process which tells you to say it ranks for you actually. So there are algorithms that you can use here really available. Rank things for you to say these are important features and those are the things that you take into account. Um, uh, there's a, 
an interesting data set to do with uh, information retrieval. It's Microsoft data set. There are crazy metrics there. Um, I should share, maybe we should use that as an example to show you. But, but anyway, so the reason why I want to go through a feature uh, selection process is this notion of the dimensionality reduction where you have limited computing power. The more features you have, the more computing power you, want, you, you need, right? So you want to um, restrict yourself to the things that are more relevant. <coughs> uh, so initial data collection, obviously, where you, you get the data and then you, 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 you visualize it and explore it to try and see if it's going to be appropriate. Um, and then the data exploration or exploratory EDA process, exploratory data analysis process, which has a dedicated lecture, by the way, so that we understand how to do this. Um, and then you obviously have to assess the quality of this information that you, the data that you want to use, right? Um, <coughs> right, so as, as part of the uh, data ident the identification of data sources process and collection of data, I mean, you want to plan the uh, data requirements, right? Plan for the data requirements and then come up with a selection criteria. Right? Once you identify the data sources, you want to be able to say, um, I, I'm going to use this criteria to decide whether I'm going to use this data source or not. <coughs> um, if you're working on a project where it's going to be difficult for you to, to source the data, maybe you could use that as a criteria for uh, not incorporating the data into your uh, model implementation process. Uh, um, and then, you now have to describe and explore the data, which is the EDA process I spoke about. And part of what you do is uh, you check for the different, um, and this is, I guess, one of the most important things here. You check for the different um, attribute types, um, and then you check for the values, right? It turns out that the different attribute types, so it could be that you're working with uh, continuous data, right? One, two, three, four, five, like if it's student scores, you know that a student can get 25.5 or 25 or 12.1, that's continuous data. If um, uh, there's this preliminary survey that we dish out to students where we ask them to what extent they think they know how to use computers, so it's on a scale, so it's a like it scale, it's a like it like scale, on a scale of one to five, ordinal values, because they're not continuous. It doesn't necessarily mean that, uh, well, you have one, two, three, four. This is not continuous. There's nothing in between here, right? These are like ordinal values. Um, so it could be working with categorical values. Are you male or female, right? In fact, for certain values like uh, uh, for gender or yeah, gender, I guess, um, there is no importance in the order. For ordinal values like this, like at scale, like at like scale, we know that five, depending on the description, is is good, is better than one, right? But when you are working with categorical values like male or female, order is not important, right? These are all important things that you need to take into account as you are identifying the attribute types, right? Don't worry, we have a discussion for different data types here who understand this. And, and it turns out that it's important for you to understand all these different attribute types because the way that you transform the data is different. The way that you transform categorical data is different from ordinal values. Right. <clears throat> anyway, so I mean, you want to assess the quality of the data. Uh, one example that I have in this next slide is um, we were using uh, Dublin Core encoded metadata as a data source, but we were able to tell that that the quality of data was horrible because we, 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 we assess the quality of the data, right? So, and the, the reason why the quality is bad is because human beings have to enter that information. I will explain the project because there are two examples that I have on this process. So I'll explain the project and you understand what I mean here. Right, so, but the bottom line is you want to be able to ascertain the quality of the, of the data that you're working with. Um, and then the data preparation process where you you really uh, go through these different broad objectives here. Data processing, the selection process, you transform the data, you derive, um, you derive uh, things from pre-existing data, right? 
trying to think of examples, perhaps not yet. Uh, you merge information. If you're using multiple data sources, at some stage, you perhaps need to merge that information into one. Uh, well, you perhaps might need to format the data in a certain way, uh, case folding maybe, who knows, right? Um, and then ultimately, you want to be able to describe the data set, the, the data set once you're done with the data preparation um, stage, really. Um, and I would like to think most of us have actually done this to a certain extent, right? Most of these things, to maybe those of us that work with data, right? It doesn't matter whether that data is coming from the database or something, a database would be the source, the data source, right? doesn't matter if you have to crawl for information on the web, uh, which was painful for some people last year. Um, anyway. <coughs> or, God forbid, if you, you have to, to go through archival records, right? Things that are, these records, right? Uh, uh, from, uh, which place is this where history of, the, records for Zambia kept, National Archives or something. I, I, I always sit there and I think, there's obviously a wealth of information there, right? But I sit there and I'm thinking, what can we do with the information we've been collecting for years? No one has bothered, right? Guys, colleagues, what I've been doing is, uh, I've been, um, and it's one of the questions in the example from last year, I've been pulling Daily Mail newspaper articles. And I, I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm thinking, there's a lot we can do with that information, right? There are patterns in there, you know, like, maybe you don't know this, but there are patterns in there. Which patterns? Nobody knows, right? I don't know. Um, a paper that we read, right? Something I've been trying ar around with is, can we, can we mine information maybe from newspaper articles and be able to, sorry, but maybe predict who is going to win the elections? or not the elections as a whole, but maybe in urban areas, right? We read an interesting paper where people came up with a prediction model. They were using Twitter data. We can't do that here because uh, our, uh, we are not very active on social media. We like <coughs> talking about, uh, sorry, but maybe it's just me, maybe people observe doing it, but we don't discuss important things, unfortunately, and so it's difficult to do that. But but maybe, maybe we can, so, so anyway, what I'm trying to say here is uh, there are countless things we can do, right? Some things are wild things, right? But hey, it's fine, you know, we can experiment with all these different things, I don't know. But the newspaper articles, maybe <laughs> there's something in there, who knows? Uh, and for, fortunately for the Daily Mail articles, is there, they are born digital, and so conversion from um, uh, PDF to text is, is is not that hard. I guess the complexity comes in because of the structure uh, imposed by newspaper articles, columns, and oh, go to page two or something to continue reading this, right? So, but but I'm sure, and I think this this is where the interesting computer science stuff might be if people have not done this already, right? Um, but I don't know. Okay, and then you want to be able to clean, as part of the data preparation process, you want to clean this information that you, you have so you collect, right? It might be messy. Uh, and you notice that uh, some of the examples that we, or some of the things we spend a lot of time on is this uh, processing tasks associated with textual content. So removing punctuations because they're irrelevant, they won't help you do anything. Uh, removing stop words if you're working with English text, for instance, stemming so that uh, boy, boys, male is more or less like has the same meaning or something. Zambia, Zambians, uh, something is the same thing, right? Zambian, Zambians, Zambia it would be stemmed to the same root word, right? So these are all the different things that uh, you typically do when you're cleaning up the data. And also some other things that you might do irrespective of whether you are handling uh, text or not is the duplication, right? So you want to be able to remove duplicates, for instance. Um, 
he wants to figure out a way of handling missing values. If you are working with student data and it happens that some inputs have not test one scores, what do you do? Right? And we have a discussion about this, the different techniques that you use. You put a zero there, you just get the mean and then put, put in the mean, for instance, different things that you can do, crazy things. Or perhaps what you could do, depending on the problem, is get rid or exclude everything with missing values. Um, you realize that you can get away uh, with this if, if uh, you have a lot of data. So if I have uh, a million records and some of them have missing values, I can say, well, fine, I'll just exclude those with missing values. But if I have um, maybe 200 observations, I don't have enough data, so I, I want to make a wise decision, not exclude them, but maybe pad the missing values with some fig or something. I don't know. Right, and then, so part of what you do again is the reconstruction, as part of the major process, you reconstruct the data set or transform it, right? Um, so that uh, it's in a form that the learning algorithms that are here are expecting. Uh, so if you're working with a, a learning algorithm that expects text, uh, surprise, surprise, it does not expect you to feed it uh, text like CSC 5741. This needs to be transformed into a form that it understands, right? Data transformation and construction. Uh, and for most of these things that I'm talking about, right, it turns out that, uh, again, that graph where we had uh, time where uh, these things are more complex, it turns out that, like for that is a Python or R, it's as easy as you just using a function, right? It's as easy as using a function. Uh, count vectorizer, for instance, right? TFIDF vectorizer, for instance. And then that's it. It converts this text into a representation which is similar to, this is slide number 29. It would convert it into a representation that is similar to, uh, to this, to this, oh, to this, right? So like if you're working with text, you will not, you work with this. Not, not actual text, doesn't work like that, right? Same goes for images. It turns out that what, what the learning algorithm is going to do is it's going to unroll the image, right? Like assuming your image is represented using R, RGB, uh, you come up with a vector representation of, of uh, the intensities associated with the pixels for that image, right? right? So you don't, I mean, behind the scenes, I guess, it's, yeah, it's just taking in an image, but it's not literally using the image. For some, for some learning algorithms or estimators, you feed them that thing, right? Uh, like for images, like uh, I guess if you're working with a learning algorithm that expects images, just feed it an image, that's fine, you don't have to do anything. But for some, you actually have to call appropriate functions to convert the data or transform it into a form that this learning algorithm is going to be able to understand. Uh, 29. Mm. This is making some bit of sense here. Okay. Uh, I mean, the reformatting, I guess, it's part of the pre-processing part. Maybe come up with appropriate naming conventions and um, yeah. Okay, and then finally, which is a part that involves uh, what you'd be, I guess, what you'd be doing here is mostly scripting. Uh, what I've done myself in the past is uh, a combination of Python scripting and shell scripting here. Um, but you could do whatever it is you want to do, right? So for instance, imagine a situation where you're getting um, input data from Facebook, for instance, or Twitter, or Facebook. Although Facebook doesn't allow you to scrape, right? You would need, and you, you've, added, you, you've decided to say, I'm going to scrape off the information from the web pages. You need to come up with a script somehow, right? Um, maybe a shell script, um, maybe a Python script, a Perl script or something. Um, so it's mostly scripting. I guess the interesting thing comes, somewhat interesting thing is actually implementation of the model because it turns out that uh, this and this is what 
involves implementation and uh, experimental design of what you're doing, right? Evaluation of what you're doing. <coughs> anyway, so the modeling part um, uh, would, would involve things like a, um, a feature set, a complete feature set that you're going to feed or that you're going to use to implement the model itself. Uh, if you're predicting where performance of the user, for instance, a student, uh, what comprehensive feature set are you going to use? Date of birth, that's a bit weird here, but test one score, motivation or interest into this course or something, attendance, right, features. And, and what you're doing here with the features is your, well you've already identified the features here, but what you're doing is your, you are, you are trying to see what influence those features are going to have on the overall performance of the model. Right. <clears throat> um, right. So what you're doing is you you come up with different uh, different alternative techniques. So combine all the different uh, um, the different features that you have. Uh, use the features in isolation. Combine them. Come up with different combinations and get the results or something. Uh, and this is where you, you actually identify also the, the different learning algorithms that you're going to use. Um, once, once, once you identify all those different learning algorithms that you're going to use, you use that as a basis to test them, to empirically test them and identify which one you're going to use in the final deployed model. Um, this is standard practice actually. Uh, typically, um, the standard metrics that you use insofar as evaluation is concerned. You want to, to assess how good what you have implemented is. Um, standard metrics include uh, accuracy, for instance, uh, precision, recall, like I said. For certain techniques like uh, clustering, it might not be as intuitive as, as, as uh, classification problems or linear regression type prob problems, but the techniques that you use. Like I know for, uh, what, what clustering technique is that? Forgotten the name. But you, you sort of like uh, visualize the result and uh, you use what they call the elbow technique to figure out where the, the sort of elbow pattern is determined. This would tell you how many clusters you need. How many clusters you should expect in the overall, with the final output of uh, you running that particular um, algorithm on the data set, right? Um, but bottom line is that for because these these learning algorithms already exist, there are already specific things or metrics that they tell you you should use for you to measure their relative uh, performance or their relative effectiveness, right? Um, in certain instances, the evaluation might take the form of, uh, uh, not effectiveness, but, or the efficiency might take the form of assessing how long it takes for that model to run, for instance. How much compute power do you need, right? Depends on the problem. Like if you are, um, if, if your model is online, it needs to be ref re refreshed um, often, then that's something that you need to take into account. But if it's an offline model where you just train it once and then you just deploy it, perhaps the, um, the efficiency from that perspective might not necessarily be important, right? But there are metrics, right, that you use. Uh, in the example that I give, I will sh talk about some of the metrics that we've, uh, we've used ourselves. Right, and so typically the, the aspects that you look at in so far as evaluation is concerned, we see the efficiency or effectiveness or efficacy if it's in a controlled environment, right? Um, reward setting, controlled environment. Um, and then you, you also need to be able to interpret the results. So in certain instances, right, there are certain problems where 60% is good enough. 60% accuracy is okay. In certain problem domains, Maybe 90% is not good enough. You want something that's 98% accurate at least, right? So you want to be able to interpret the results that are coming from here. Right, and then also be able to figure out exactly how you're going to present these results to the user, right? Remember I said, uh, the, there's a part where I said the um, variation criteria sometimes might be technical, right? So a question to ask yourself is how do you 
convey those technical, those gory details to an end user who will not understand what precision or recall is. You know, the end users that might not care so much about the F score, right? So you want a way to be able to easily convey the message to the user to say, uh, this is what these results mean. Um, and then, obviously, this is, oh, sorry, this was the deploy, this is the deployment, something. Okay, I'm talking about deployment, not evaluation. Um, identify who is going to, who is going to, to use the final output, right? The person I was talking about who went to Kenya and came up with a prediction model for students, right? They're going to pass or fail. Uh, the end users were teachers and administrators at that school. If uh, you're coming up with a prediction model that's going to tell you whether or not it's cancer, you don't want to give that to an end user like a patient, right? It, I think doctors are trained in the art of uh, conveying that message, that bad message, I'm sorry, but you have cancer. You don't use an app to say you have cancer, right? Uh, but the doctor has to use that maybe so that they know something. Um, I don't know if that quick run through uh, was good enough. What we are going to start doing after this, uh, we're going to dive into Python and then we'll start looking at some of these things. Beginning here, by the way, uh, the story continues here, where we look at uh, data preprocessing and tr transformation, model implementation, uh, evaluation, and then, well, evaluation. We actually focus on these three parts. We don't, uh, the, I mean, the only thing we'll do that's closer to deployment is just highlight how people deploy models, right? An API, perhaps. That's, that's almost always what people do, actually. You just implement an API. So you feed it input and then it gives you the result in form of the JSON response or something. Um, so we do not, we don't look at business understanding. We focus more on data preparation, modeling, and evaluation. This is where all those different things I was talking about when I was running us through the different themes of the course come in. Uh, I hope that was uh, good enough. Uh, this thing, I don't know, we fixed it. I don't know what happened. I don't know if this is a good enough introduction to the crisp DM model, right? Uh, but to try and reinforce that, I have two examples of things that I have been a part of myself, uh, things that I've done recently. Hopefully this will help consolidate some of these things we spoke about. Um, uh, I will make mention of certain things, a caveat here, like uh, this is mostly textual content. So some of the things we were doing might not be applicable to image data, for instance, or sound, right? But nonetheless, maybe it will help, uh, it will help us understand some of these things we've discussed, I hope. I don't know if that's fine. <laughs>